We've heard a lot this morning about looking forward to the future, to what's to come. For the next few minutes, I want you, in fact, to change your perspective and join me with a small adventure in history, looking back. My primary training is, in fact, as a historian, although I'm always looking for ways to take the lessons that we can learn from history to help us become better, more innovative, and creative leaders. We live in a culture that places a value on presence. I, for one, am glad that you are all present in this room with me right now. We worry about presence through our online presence and how we have to be constantly present, updating our Facebook or Twitter feed or Instagram account. We think about presence in terms of how can we encourage children to be more present in the classroom, to avoid distractions. We're told that great leaders are present. I also hear a lot about presence in the ongoing discussions about work-life balance, where it often seems to me we're focused on how to be present for everything and absent for none. I think we fear absence. I want to make the argument today that there is a value in absence. There's, of course, a value in presence, but there is a value in absence. We tend to get very attached to the idea that absence entails cost, and it does. But it also contains the possibility for great value. To talk to you about this story of the value of absence, I want to talk to you about two groups of what I call reluctant sojourners, people like ourselves, who I think are often reluctant to leave that which we care about most, whether it be our family, our friends, our home. We hold on to those things very closely. Now, as you'll see, my groups of reluctant sojourners are very different, separated by a great deal of time and space. The first group of reluctant sojourners I want to talk to you about are 19th century American Protestants who journeyed to the Holy Land. Now, that seems like an unlikely example, I realize, so let me explain. We think of ourselves as living in a period of great technological innovation and change, but if you ask a historian like myself, the 19th century, hands down, was the period of great technological innovation. The world is indeed smaller, with phones in our pockets, but I think about the moment that the first transatlantic telegram made its way from Europe to America, and how the world in that instance collapsed, became so much smaller than it had ever been. The 19th century saw the developments of improvements in train travel and steamship travel. We had subway cars rumbling underneath the cities of America for the first time ever. This is a period of great innovation and change. One of the things that happened because of this innovation and change was a new travel and leisure culture. Americans suddenly dreamed about the possibilities of seeing Niagara Falls, the wonders of Florida, Mammoth Cave, Kentucky. All of these were great 19th century tourist destinations. And we think this is the period of the age of experience. People wanted to experience things in ways they had not before. There was one place that held particular pride of place in American travel culture in the 19th century, and that was the Holy Land. People wanted to walk where Jesus had once walked. Now, one person in particular helped bring attention to the Holy Land to a new sort of level. Historians, in fact, cite Mark Twain as one of the people who helped ferment what might be called Holy Land mania in the 19th century. So Mark Twain in 1867 boards a steamship in Brooklyn with a hapless group of pilgrims and then details their journey in his most famous book, Innocence Abroad. It was the bestseller of his lifetime. And he basically described everything that happened to this group of pilgrims from the moment they stepped on board the ship until they came home and all of their antics and flawed ways. Now, Mark Twain's book is only one of many, many, many travelogues written by Protestants who went to the Holy Land in the 19th century. I can, in fact, fill this stage, literally, with books written by Protestants who went to the Holy Land. They wrote books, they wrote magazine articles, they took the cameras with them that, for the first time, allowed them to capture their own images of the Holy Land, and they published and republished. I think that was someone's email, so. Published and republished these books. So why did they do that? Once you have one book like Mark Twain bestseller, why do we need 20,000 other accounts of your journey to the Holy Land? Many of these individuals felt an obligation to share their story. 
They wanted to provide other individuals who didn't have the opportunity to go to have a virtual travel experience, and they, in fact, indeed, actually described it in those terms. There was something else going on as well, in that many people who went to the Holy Land, in fact, were sponsored by their churches or congregations. So you as a minister, after 40 years of good and faithful service, would be rewarded with your own trip to the Holy Land, which sounds good, but maybe not when you're 70 or 80 and face the prospect of a three to four month trip followed by rides on camels. So good and bad, right? So we have these amazing sources of all of these accounts of people who left, who went away. And if we read through these accounts, there's one commonality in many of them. They were reluctant to go. They were reluctant sojourners. They worried about the cost of being away from home for three to four months. They rightly worried about the possibility of death and illness, which affected many of them. They thought about family and friends left behind. Who was going to monitor their church at home? What were they going to miss? They were going to be totally out of the loop. And they also worried about the possibility that the Holy Land, though it might confirm everything they thought they knew about the Bible, might undermine their faith. And this was a very real concern for many of them. So what happened? Well, a couple of things happened. One, we find that it was the case that for many of them, their entire conceptual worldview was changed by what they saw when they went abroad. The religious landscape of the typical 19th century American Protestant is what our church circle in Kingsport looks like. You got your first Baptist, your first Presbyterians, your first Methodists. Take your choice, right? All claim their first. When they went to the Holy Land, they found that those categories that divided the world no longer applied there. They had suddenly encountered Russian Orthodox and Greek Orthodox. Many, for the first time, encountered, encountered Islam. They encountered Judaism. They realized that the conceptual worldview that they had was, in fact, a narrow slice of a much larger picture. So what happened about their views of the Bible? In fact, many of them found it did profoundly influence the way that they saw the Bible. Thomas DeWitt Tal Talmadge was one of the most famous 19th century Protestant ministers who, again, left Brooklyn and went on a Holy Land pilgrimage, which he then published a book called From Manger to Throne, documenting his account. He was also really smart because he republished the book under multiple titles and then resold it to lots of different audiences. So, same book, different cover, basically. But in the book, he writes, Indeed, in Palestine, I have found a new Bible, and it can never be to me what it was. Now, this is a potentially very disconcerting idea. Right? This is what they worried about, that they would find a new Bible. And many of them encountered things which they had to reconcile between the text and the land. Now, Talbot went on to clarify that he thought what he had found had made, in fact, the Bible better. He went on, he was a very excitable guy, and he wrote, the Bible is fresher, truer, lovelier, grander, mightier. Protestants, in fact, use a very unusual phrase to describe the Holy Land in the 19th century. They called it the fifth gospel. Now, this is a heretical claim. For Christian history, we have prided ourselves on a closed canon. There are four gospels, no books can be added, none can be taken away. But these individuals thought that something about this place actually added an entire new gospel account that made them see the Bible differently. So why am I telling you this story? In their absence, these individuals discovered that even what they knew best appeared radically different, more powerful and innovative. They were extremely biblically literate, and yet they found that this exposure to a new experience, being away from what they knew most intimately, changed their view of everything. And in fact, this period of Holy Land mania initiated what was a sort of revolution in American Protestantism, with an increased focus on the Holy Land, new Bibles, new Sunday school curriculum, new theological developments. We know there is great power in absence. This is not a surprise to us, right? We hear about this in lots of different ways, about the importance of moving away from that which we know best. In fact, research backs this up. We know that to be able to perform at a consistent level, to be resilient in what we do, we must have rest. 
We know from a learning perspective that changing the physical location of where you learn something can increase your retention of that information. And yet, I think that many of us are still reluctant sojourners. We're resistant to leave. I've thought more about this idea of reluctant sojourners through my work with the Roan Scholars Leadership Program at East Tennessee State University. The Roan Scholars Program was founded in 1997 by local businessman and innovator Louis Gump, who had a vision of a scholarship program specifically focused on leadership development. Students are selected from regional high schools. You've already heard from one of our Roan Scholars this morning, Morgan, Morgan Munsey. Um, <laughs> are selected from local high schools their senior year and given a full tuition scholarship to ETSU and, more importantly, four years of personalized leadership development training. If I had to describe the Roan model of what we do, it's challenge plus support. We challenge students to do things that they sometimes think that there is no way they could possibly do, and we know that they can. One of the ways we try to challenge students is we encourage study abroad and global experiences generally. So as a mentor and advisor to these students, they show up in my office and they are reluctant sojourners, right? And I want to tell them I've heard every excuse you might make about why you can't leave. And so they typically go through, I can't leave mom and dad, I can't leave my family, but then they get to one that makes me pause. They say, I can't leave the student groups that I'm involved with. I can't leave the leadership roles that I'm in. I can't leave the community organizations that rely upon me. And that makes me pause. And I think to myself, these students are doing everything we want, right? They're emerging and developing into leaders in their own right. And this concern about leaving that which we lead is real. When my students say this to me, how can I possibly leave? I pose a question back. What's your model of leadership? One of the things that I've begun to understand is that there are certain models of leadership that make us more open to the possibility of absence, that create spaces for us to leave, to see something new, to be re-enlivened, and to come back with a new perspective. So, we're going to need to take a brief foray at this moment into leadership theory. There are lots of ways to divide up the study of leadership. Leadership as something to be studied and analyzed particularly emerged in the beginning of the 20th century of if we could figure out what made for great leaders, we can improve the leadership of this country, within industry, within our own homes. And so those first wave of scholars began to suggest that perhaps leadership was trait-based. And they focused on the idea that leadership is who you are. Now, think of George Washington, right? What is it about George Washington that made him a great leader? And those scholars began to take examples of great leadership from business and from industry, from politics, from science, and describe the characteristics with the hope that we might find the holy grail of what makes for a great leader. But they had a problem. It turned out there wasn't a lot of commonalities across those lists. And so researchers began then to switch to the idea that perhaps leadership is what you do. Now, that is great news for most of us in this room, that we don't have to be George Washington, that we can develop into leaders over time. Think about the work of Stephen Covey, John Maxwell, Sheryl Sandberg, the idea that through certain habits and behaviors, we can develop into great leaders. So it's what you do. Now, the issue was people began to say, well, that's great, but what if, we have to, what if we are constrained by where we are? What if it also matters where you are in terms of your ability to enable change and progress? In other words, you can be a great leader and have great leadership habits, but if you're in the wrong place, you may find yourself very constrained. By contrast, if you're in the right place, you may find yourself able to do things you didn't think was possible. This is a relational model of leadership, one that emphasizes not a hierarchical one where we have George Washington at the top or where you are trying to climb the stairs, but one that views leaders as enmeshed, reliant upon other people. If we move to this bottom area over here, we see the possibility of absence. 
Relational models of leadership create the possibility to move out of those leadership roles and to come back with new innovation and insight. Now, the reality is that all of us are still waiting for the invitation for our three to four month sabbatical, right? So we can go wherever we dream of going. The reality is that most of us will still have to leave here and go pick up the kids and have families that rely upon us, and we have communities that need us. So the possibility of going away in the way that my 19th century American Protestants did is somewhat limited. So I want to close today by thinking about practices of absence, ways to bring absence into your life in small ways that give you the opportunity for new creativity and insight. I owe this idea to my colleague Scott Jeffress at the Rhone Scholars Leadership Program. Scott had a very long military career before joining us at the helm of the Rhone Scholars Program. One day, Scott and I were talking, and he told me about the idea from his military background of a six-month review. Now, most of us are familiar in a corporate environment of a six-month review after you start a new job. What is going well? What do you need to improve upon? Is there hope for you here? Yes or no? This is a different idea. Scott told me about the idea of what if you had a six-month review where you disappeared from your job one day and your review was based upon how things went six months without you. That's a relational model of leadership. That's enabling others to work towards common goals that in your absence can be pursued. Hierarchical models of leadership like we saw in terms of trait-based or behavioral-based models of leadership don't allow for that sort of imaginative exercise. If we value absence, I believe we have an obligation to create spaces of absence for others, and I'm very grateful. This is a space of absence right now. We are absent from what we normally do to join together in a creative enterprise. I think about the idea of creating spaces of absence for others when I teach in the classroom. My students often arrive at class completely harried. They have run from point to point. Some of them have worked way too late, either on homework or at jobs the night before. They grabbed lunch on the go, and then they arrive in my classroom, often late in the afternoon, with the expectation that I need their full presence. And that's a really hard thing to do. So I've begun to start my class more and more frequently with five minutes at the beginning of class where we have effectively silence. I pose some sort of question. It may be related to what our discussion topic at hand is for the day, or it may be more tangentially removed. And I ask them to think about it, to write down some notes, to begin to center themselves. And it makes a tremendous difference in their ability to be present in the classroom. Now, for those of you who are indoctrinated into the idea of efficient meetings run by agendas and task lists, what I have just suggested to you sounds terrifying, right? We don't show up and begin to put other ideas on the table. But I'd ask you, what if you started your next meeting with stopping the clock? By asking five minutes for people to take some time to reflect on maybe the bigger questions that relate to the task at hand, giving people the space confined to share those ideas and then moving on to the task at hand. Finally, when we are given the opportunity for absence, like this one, or bigger opportunities for absence, we have an obligation to share our story, just like those 19th century Protestants who recorded in detail everything they saw and how it affected them. So how will you share your story? How will you share your story with your colleagues and your classmates today about what you've learned and heard? When given the opportunity for absence, we have an obligation to come back to others and share that information. So, my question for you. Are you ready to value absence? Are you ready to accept the fact that undoubtedly, there is risk from stepping away from what we love and hold most dearly, our pursuit of success through jobs or through our family or through our work, and yet the possibility that it will bring us great innovation and insight that will teach us to see that which we think we know best in a completely new light. My hope is that you are ready to value absence and that your experience will be like the famous words of T.S. Eliot in his poem, Little Getting. Eliot writes, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. Thank you.